So it's really a pleasure for me to be able to deliver a talk to people from uh, who come from very different fields and uh, have different uh, points of view on, on all of these things. The topic of my presentation today has to do with uh, values. I myself am uh, an ecologist, uh, uh, a biological scientist, and uh, you know, with values at the core of what I want to talk about today, I figured it would be a good idea to start just by declaring some of my own, because one of the themes is that, you know, our values can influence the, the science that we do. And so just in case anybody during my presentation uh, was under the mistaken impression that I was sent by some evil oil company or something to convince you that uh, there were reasons that scientists might be biased, uh, uh, I want to assure you that that's not the case. So, you know, one of the things that I value most in life are these very large wild spaces like the Pac de la Gaspésie and Mont Albao that we can see uh, in the photo and some of the wild species that they support, like the small uh, population of uh, caribou, like we can see uh, on the left. In the mail the other day, I just got my uh, badge of honor for having bought some Christmas presents, which were uh, donations in people's names to the to the Nature Conservancy. So I very much uh, am a lover of uh, nature, uh, and it is in fact those exact biases that concern me when it comes to the possibility that scientists might um, have uh, have some difficulty, uh, you know, being maximally objective when they when they go about doing their science. So the first thing I want to do is to ask you to uh, think about uh, what it is that you see in, in the virtual sense. So when you think, you know, ecologically or environmentally about a place like New Zealand, an isolated oceanic island, uh, in this case, a very interesting one, uh, because it has a relatively recent history of human colonization and settlement. So people of Polynesian origin arrived uh, something like 800 years ago, people of European origin a few hundred years ago. And the changes that they uh, brought to this island have been uh, profound. We can see some different shades of uh, uh, green on this island. And so just by way of, get, uh, I guess, both getting the audience to participate a little bit, uh, I, I'd just love to know, like, you know, when you think ecologically or environmentally about New Zealand and the changes that people have uh, brought to a place like this, what, what comes to mind? And so I invite you, I'm gonna click the chat here. So and anything that comes to mind, just write it in the chat and then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll pick it up after that. Cats, possums. Endemism and exotic species. Diversity of ecosystems. Excellent. Two seas who rejoice. Pastures. Got some poetry in here. Cities. So a few things on this list, you know, I, I'm an ecologist. And so things like exotic species, which include things like cats and possums, have had a huge uh, influence. There are a whole bunch of endemic species, by which we mean species that live only um, uh, in New Zealand. And then people have, uh, you know, done things like converted, you know, natural habitats to pastures uh, and to cities. So that captures a lot uh, of what we get there. So let's look now at... You know what? What would you what would you read about a place like New Zealand if you were to open uh, you know a textbook in ecology or conservation or or any one of our uh, many journals? Uh, so, you know, a dominant theme of this story when I give this talk to ecologists, these are actually some of the first things that come up uh, are are these very um, you know drastic effects on many of the native species and habitats. So, you know, roughly three quarters of the forests that were that covered most of New Zealand have been converted to some other use, and that includes pastures and cities, as people uh, mentioned. Uh, of the endemic birds that live there, many of them were flightless and completely defenseless against uh, some of the predators that were introduced, and roughly half of them have gone extinct. And then there's just been this massive influx of, of non-native species, like the possums that somebody mentioned. If you go to New Zealand, uh, you know, you can, you can buy you know, mittens and hats made of possum and you're made to feel like you're, you're, you're doing your patriotic duty by uh, buying them. So these things are all true and they, you know, we can put them under the heading of biodiversity is in trouble. Uh, but there's some other things that are, that are equally true uh, when we think about biodiversity. So the number of plant species in New Zealand has roughly doubled since the time uh, that people arrived. So there were something like 2000 native species, a very small number of them have gone extinct and roughly 2000 species from elsewhere in the world have now naturalized in New Zealand. So there's you know, twice as many species of plants there. 
despite all those extinctions of birds, there's in fact about the same number of bird species as there, as there ever were, because for the, each one that was uh, driven extinct, there's another one that's been introduced and uh, naturalized from elsewhere. And uh, where there used to be no uh, native land mammals at all, there are now uh, dozens of them. And so all of those uh, you know, factors tell you that either biodiversity is increasing in some sense, or even, um, uh, or even stable. And so then the question I ask when I think about these two sets of things, both of which are entirely true, these are, these are, these are fairly straightforward facts. Uh, you know, the question then is in, in a field like conservation and, and ecology, the one that I'm in, why is the narrative that we hear about New Zealand 99% about uh, biodiversity decline? Um, you know, part of the reason that you might hear is that, you know, all of this conversion of habitat and loss of native species is somehow going to uh, compromise the ability of humans to support themselves. But it's, to me, most definitely an open question as to whether or not these changes have made New Zealand either more or less able to support human livelihoods. In, in many, many respects, we would have to say that, in fact, that the current ecological configuration of New Zealand is much uh, better suited to supporting human livelihoods than it might have been uh, before there were agricultural fields where people were growing food, for example. So the point of telling you all these stories is just to say that, uh, you know, faced with a with a you know a, a large number of facts about ecological change, we tend to tell very particular stories about uh, those types of changes. So what do I mean when we talk about uh, values? You know, the people in this audience probably know far more about this topic than I do. So I'll just essentially give you my understanding and sort of the basis for the rest of uh, what I'll talk about. So on one hand. Um, we have what people call epistemic values relating to the production of knowledge. And so if you're doing science like I am, almost all of us doing science sort of by definition have to share certain values, like it is good to try to be objective and accurate and so on. And on the other hand, we have uh, what people call contextual values. So these are individual preferences with respect to moral or political or cultural uh, questions. And we are, we are all very familiar with the fact that there's a great uh, diversity among people in which types of uh, contextual values they put more uh, weight on. And so one of my questions is whether or not these can come into conflict. Can certain uh, contextual values that we have influence uh, our ability to uh, achieve some of these uh, epistemic values as, as scientists? Uh, so as I said, I'm, a, I'm an ecologist, uh, conservation biologist, evolutionary biologist, various uh, titles uh, I might use. And so when I say, what are our values? Uh, you know, what exactly do I mean by that? So the field that we call conservation biology really only came into existence in the 1980s. And a very well-known paper that sort of declared the emergence of this new field was written by Michael Soule. And he laid out some postulates of conservation biology. And some of them he explicitly called normative postulates. So having to do with values. And here's just two of the most important ones. So diversity of organisms is good and ecological complexity is good. So a place with lots of diversity and complexity, we're gonna say that it is better than a place that has less diversity and less complexity. In a more recent book uh, by Jonathan Newman and colleagues uh, called Defending Biodiversity, they paint a picture of what a great many you know, ecologists or environmental uh, scientists prefer when it comes to the way that uh, nature ought to look. Uh, so we tend to have a preference for natural over modified habitats, natural meaning you know, with minimal influence by people. Uh, we prefer the native species uh, over those that were introduced directly or indirectly by people to a new continent. And we prefer the historical state of uh, certain communities or ecosystems versus uh, their, their current versions that people have uh, modified. So uh, if we put all that together, we can say that generally speaking, you know, this group of people uh, to which I belong, we, we strongly prefer diverse, complex communities of native species that form ecosystems looking as much uh, like they did historically as possible. And an additional thing that we can add to, you know, our list of values here is that there's this sort of this core premise of this field of research that justifies our existence. And that is that biodiversity is in serious trouble. This is one of the reasons uh, that the story uh, I showed about New Zealand is, uh, um, em emphasizes in particular the, the loss side of that uh, equation. Okay, so how does that, how does this manifest in how uh, individual scientists go about doing their science, doing their science? So here's, uh, you know, one example. Uh, this is uh, me as I was, uh, you know, in my undergraduate career in the 
uh, early 90s. And so, you know, the existing values that I, that I brought to, you know, my, my scientific training was that I really, really like wild places and creatures and the tranquility of being in nature. So these large wild places that people can go to uh, and enjoy. And so, you know, what did, what did I believe was true about uh, these sorts of issues? Well, you know, giants of the, of the field like Paul Ehrlich and E.O. Wilson, uh, E.O. Wilson passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, they would say things like, you know, in my readings, native species are the best, extinctions uh, could doom humanity. Uh, you know, to my young mind, that sounded about right. So those things must be true. So what do I do? I go about and I become an ecologist. Uh, and indeed, you know, it's turned out these many years later that uh, one of the great advantages of, of doing what I do is that on company time, I get to be out uh, in nature, enjoying the places that I uh, so greatly value. And so what kind of science do, do I do? So when I was doing my PhD, you know, what, what am I going to study? I'm going to go find something that, that, you know, maybe people have, have screwed up in some way, monkeyed around with. And, uh, you know, inevitably, we end up with the conclusion that people are bad for biodiversity and for human well-being. All the things that we've done uh, to landscapes are, uh, we, we tend to emphasize the sense in which they are to our own detriment. So I'm, you know, I think quite representative of many of the people that have gone into this field and the kinds of trajectories they've taken in their scientific careers. Now let's imagine some other person with uh, very different values that nonetheless chooses to uh, pursue a similar kind of career. So this other hypothetical person has no you know, special relationship with nature, but they're not a complete sociopath. So they, um, you know, they do have some human being, uh, human well-being uh, is one of their central interests. And you know, what, what do they believe about that? So they don't have any particular preferences over the way that uh, you know uh, un unmanaged wild places ought to look, uh, and you know to their uh, perception, human modification of the earth has in fact enhanced human well-being. Agriculture uh, and so on are the leading causes of biodiversity loss, but they are also of fairly obvious importance to uh, feeding the many billions of people on our planet. So what does this person do? They become an ecologist anyway. This is obviously the hypothetical hypothetical uh, part of my story. Maybe they did it because, uh, because of the money. Uh, and, uh, but they might do some different kinds of ecological science. So they might choose to study agricultural landscapes, uh, agroecology, and in doing so, they might come to the conclusion that people uh, you know, over the centuries and millennia have figured out how to use land much more efficiently uh, to the great benefit of human well-being. So we can see that two you know, different people uh, will bring different values to the table in the same, you know, basic field of study, uh, and they can come to uh, very different conclusions about, you know, whether or not humans have had a positive or a negative benefit on um, uh, wild landscapes and how that feeds back onto uh, human well-being. Now, if the group of people uh, that was doing ecology uh, was broadly representative of society or the stakeholders of whatever science we produce, uh, then we could be less worried about individual biases skewing the whole field because hopefully, you know, different people's biases would cancel one another out. Um, but people who have written about values in science, you know, worry that as a group, uh, I'm, just, I'm really only talking about ecologists, but here, uh, you know, there are thoughts about as scientists as a whole uh, being quite unrepresentative of the diverse whole stakeholders that are affected by science, unrepresentative in terms of their values. And in a group, if those values are held in common, it's, it's pretty easy not even to notice that they're there. Or when you do notice, it's always in light of some opposing group outside of science. And those people must be wrong. Uh, and therefore, uh, we don't maybe even realize kind of the, the kinds of influence that our values can have. I see something written in the chat. I'm just going to go have a look. Anthropocentric values. Uh, we can come back to that later. Um, okay. So one question we might ask then is whether or not ecologist values are representative of uh, of broader society. So of the group of people that are doing ecology, uh, you know, we talk a lot about wanting diversity among among scientists along many different axes. Uh, along the along the axis of people's values, do we have uh, decent diversity in the field? And I think there's just not a chance that we do. I think far, far more people fall uh, in line with the values that I showed for myself than for the hypothetical other person. 
Okay, so I don't actually have, I was un, un, unable to find any data where people surveyed actually colleges, but I'm going to show you a couple, you know, little statistics or graphs on, uh, you know, political affiliations of academics in the United States. So here are uh, academics in a range of fields that, that don't necessarily include mine. And so we have a ratio of Democrats to Republicans. So what is this ratio among academics uh, in these fields? Uh, this, of course, you know, that, that distinction, Democrat, Republican, simplifies, you know, a very wide range of values that people can have. Uh, but I think it's quite telling that this ratio is about 15 to 1. So, uh, you know, the, the representation of, of Republicans here is, uh, you know, a rounding error different from zero, essentially. Uh, in a different study where they surveyed, you know, almost 500 sociologists in the United States and asked them, you know, to put themselves in one of these, uh, you know, political categories, we can argue about, you know, where they all belong. Uh, but, you know, again, something, you know, not, not far from zero uh, is the proportion of people that are somewhere right of what we would call moderate on the political spectrum. So I think that uh, people with certain values are overrepresented and other values severely underrepresented in uh, academia. And I think it's highly reasonable to think that ecologists fall uh, along similar lines. Uh, so what are the, you know, let, let's, let's go into a little bit more detail on what I actually did in terms of, of research and how uh, some of these values, which I may not have even recognized at the time, uh, may have influenced what I did. So when I went and I did my PhD, it was in uh, central New York state where the history of uh, forest cover and land use is quite similar to what we would find uh, elsewhere in, you know, broad swath of areas in eastern uh, North America. So prior to the arrival of uh, people of European origin in the 18th century, uh, essentially the entire landscape was forest. There were most certainly uh, native peoples um, using portions of the land for agriculture, uh, but not nearly to the same extent as was the case, uh, you know, 50 or 100 years after the uh, arrival of Europeans. And so today, uh, you know, a relatively small proportion of the landscape is still uh, forested. And uh, the rest of it is used for some other anthropogenic uh, use. And we can see in this, in, this, in this map that I've created that those non-forested areas are represented just by white space. This is a very common way to show uh, maps of this nature in ecology. And this was exciting to me uh, because, you know, it fell in line with, you know, what is one of the most uh, influential ideas in uh, ecology, this theory of island biogeography. Uh, so it was based on oceanic islands, and the idea is that very small islands will tend to have elevated extinction rates. Uh, islands that are very distant from any other islands or from some sort of mainland will have, you know, few species arriving over time, and therefore they'll be relatively impoverished in terms of their biotas. And the idea is that we are actually uh, creating uh, archipelagos of little bits of habitat by converting uh, our natural habitats to things like agriculture, which we can see in this um, series of diagrams on the right, which look a lot like uh, what I showed for uh, central New York state. And again, what's separating those little patches of habitat, as we call them, is just white space. And so to an ecologist, what do we, you know, what, what, what is that white space exactly? So I might go and do a study just in those remaining four forest fragments, but, but what's happening in that white space? Uh, and so really we most often just consider it, it's just non-habitat, whatever's there, it's not, uh, you know, native habitat. And we, so we just talk about it having been uh, destroyed, whatever was there has been destroyed and now uh, it's just white, or maybe we call it a matrix. So it's whatever is separating uh, these natural bits of habitat. And it really mostly just prevents, it presents a challenge to organisms that are, you know, maybe trying to get between these different uh, patches of forest to fulfill their needs. But in the real world, what is actually in that white space? So hold on to your chairs. You're going to see a little animation here that reveals what's actually underneath uh, this map. So there's what things actually look like from the air. We can see those dark areas, which are uh, patches of forest. This looks like any number of areas in, uh, in southern Quebec as well. Uh, but it's clearly not just empty space, uh, you know, like, like water in the ocean between uh, these patches of habitat. So we've got pastures, crop fields, roads, ditches, yards, uh, abandoned fields, and those other habitats are home to a great number of species that are not found in the forest. And so uh, the diversity across this landscape is almost certainly higher 
uh, than it would be if it were made up of entirely one type of habitat. Uh, you know, one example of a type of species is, that thrives in those open habitats or certain kinds of open habitats is this bottle link. And in areas of New England, where most of the landscape is actually coming back to forest, they're trying to keep parts of it open uh, via uh, people's interventions in order to maintain some habitat uh, for these birds that are essentially dependent on uh, the anthropogenic habitats. Here's just a little data to support uh, what I was saying about, you know, landscape scale diversity. Uh, this set of authors divided Southern Ontario into, you know, a great number of, uh, you know, landscapes. They were, I don't know, 100 square kilometers or something. And then they had, uh, they counted up the number of bird species in each of them. And as we go from left to right uh, in this graph, uh, maybe I'll get my pointer going here. Uh, we can see that, you know, in a landscape like the one on the right, where maybe there's, you know, we'd say it's like 30 or 40 percent natural area, the forests, there's actually more species of birds supported in the landscape like that than there would be if the entire landscape were uh, entirely natural area like forest. Uh, so we get a maximum diversity where we have a mixture of land uses, not where it's entirely either forested or entirely uh, anthropogenic. And so when I go about doing a study, as I did as a PhD student, of how you know, the history of land use in a place like this influences plant diversity, uh, I make certain decisions, like simply not counting species that don't uh, live primarily in the forested habitat. So there's any number of plants that really grow only outside of the forested habitats, or I should say primarily outside of the forest habitats. Sometimes they show up in the forests, but I'm simply not gonna count them when I, when, when I encounter them, because I only wanna count those that really depend on the forests. Uh, so things like the white trillium uh, is something that I'll count. It is entirely dependent on the deep shade of these forests. Uh, and things like goldenrod, which is also a native species, which thrives out in the open and does uh, sometimes show up in these forest patches, especially some of the younger forest patches, I'm simply not gonna count it when I come across it. And so the group of species I'm gonna study, I'm gonna call them forest herbs, herbaceous plants uh, that live in forests. Uh, one other sort of wrinkle to mention when it came to studying this landscape is that there's, there are quite a number of areas that in fact uh, were first converted to agriculture and then uh, were uh, abandoned and allowed to return to forests. So the light green, uh, patches of forest in this diagram are what, what we call recent forests. So they've grown up on abandoned agricultural land. Some of them might be as much as 100 or 150 years old, but we know that there was a history of agriculture there. The dark ones are what we call ancient forests. So they've always been forests throughout the period uh, since uh, European settlement. And so I did a survey uh, of, of the plant diversity and a bunch of uh, forest patches of this nature. So one of the first results was that there was clearly a lower diversity of this group of plants I call forest herbs in the recent than in the ancient forest. So even if we allow a forest to grow back on an abandoned agricultural field for up to 100 years, it still has lower plant diversity uh, for this group of plants, the forest herbs, than uh, in these old forests. So this tells us, you know, maybe we need to protect those older forests. But had I actually counted all the plants, so overall plant diversity, not just the selected group, I might have seen uh, precisely the reverse. Some of these younger forests have both representatives of uh, the deep shaded forest and some disturbance adapted plants that need a bit more light, let's say. Uh, and so in fact, plant diversity overall might show the opposite pattern. Uh, the symbol beta uh, is what ecologists use uh, to quantify how different uh, two patches of habitat are, or how, two, how different two areas are in terms of the species that are there. So two places that have exactly the same species in them would have a very low beta diversity. They're very similar. Two, space, two areas that have completely different species in them would have a very high beta diversity. And so what I found was that these young forests, the recent forests, had lower uh, beta diversity, which means they're more similar to one another, uh, which gets people worried because it means that the whole landscape is getting more homogenous, maybe. Uh, so that was my conclusion. But if I actually think about the entire landscape and not just these contrasts between pairs of the young forests, in fact, the old and the young forests are quite different from one another. And so across this entire landscape, I would guess that in fact, overall beta diversity might actually be higher in the contemporary landscape than it was uh, before. So here's just two examples of results where simply by treating that white space and the species that live in them as basically non-existent, I can generate a set of one set of results when had I just counted everything, all the plants that were there, I might have found something uh, very different. 
And so when you show these results to other ecologists and you show them the results on the left, they say, yes, of course, people are bad for biodiversity, they homogenize things, we know that, uh, thank you for your results, we'll add them to our list of reasons to act. Uh, and then you show them results because there are results in the literature showing exactly the opposite when you look at um, a full set of plants. The initial reaction is, yeah, but they don't really want this to be true, or they don't want you to say it because it's gonna give the people the impression that maybe humans uh, aren't so bad. Uh, after all, although these things are, are can, can be equally true uh, and important to know about this landscape as the ones on the left. And so, you know, the, the question is, you know, what, am I alone in having made certain decisions probably based on values in the field that kind of pushed me towards finding one set of results? And I think the answer is almost certainly uh, no. Uh, so here's a paper published in uh, Nature uh, a few years ago, in which the title basically tells you what they found. So uh, anthropogenic disturbance in tropical forests can double biodiversity loss from deforestation. So deforestation is, you know, the removal of forests and it caused a certain degree of biodiversity loss. And then the disturbance within those remaining forest patches, you know, caused just as much loss of biodiversity as did the loss of forest to begin with. And so then the question is, does this paper demonstrate that disturbance causes biodiversity loss? I think most people take the word biodiversity to mean the diversity of life uh, in these forests, not the diversity of uh, selected uh, species there. Uh, and the authors of this paper, uh, you know, their methods were very clear. They didn't hide anything, but in their analysis, they restricted the analysis only to the forest species, just as I'd done. And they specifically said to avoid attributing value to species that are typical of open areas or species that are invasive or essentially species that have um, a native range elsewhere than uh, the one in which uh, the study was conducted. And so really what this study found was that uh, anthropogenic disturbance altered which species succeed in this forest, not the overall biodiversity of these forests. And I think that's an important distinction. How common is this kind of thing? Uh, so I want to show you this one case study where there was actually a more direct look across many studies at the role that people's values might play in how they emphasize or interpret their own results that they find. So Lenore Farrag is an ecologist at uh, Carleton University and for several decades she's been studying uh, habitat fragmentation. And it's important to note that when we say habitat fragmentation, it's important to distinguish it from habitat loss. So if I get rid of half the forest in a landscape, uh, that's not what we call fragmentation, that's called loss. Fragmentation is the degree to which those forests that are remaining are in lots of little pieces, which would be high fragmentation, or clustered into a few large uh, patches of forest, which would be less fragmentation. And Lenore has done very uh, thorough reviews of the literature, finding that in more than half the cases she found, uh, surprisingly, the effects were actually positive. So when you break habitat into many little pieces, uh, many of the species actually benefit from that kind of habitat configuration compared to the situation where uh, the habitat fragments are fewer and larger. But that result isn't really what I want to get into. I want to show you uh, what she discovered when she looked at how people described results in different papers. So I'm going to show you a bar chart in which we're going to compare uh, how the authors of, of given scientific papers describe the results in their abstract versus what the actual results show. So if you look at the tables and the figures of uh, a scientific paper, she found some studies where there were only negative effects of fragmentation. So whatever you know, responses they measured, they were always negatively affected by fragmentation. Uh, some studies only found uh, positive effects, and then some studies found uh, a particular, uh, a, a mix of negative and positive. And so here we can see uh, that when only negative effects of fragmentation were found in the actual data, the, the very large majority of authors in their abstracts described those results faithfully. So something like 80% of the authors said in the abstract that indeed the effects of fragmentation uh, were negative. In the other cases, they simply didn't say anything about it or they said effects were neutral or mixed. So this is you know, an accurate reflection of the results in what the scientists decided to write about those results. When there were a mixture of negative and positive effects, uh, again, there was fairly faithful uh, description of that in the abstract. Most of the authors described that as uh, neutral or mixed. But when there were only positive effects, uh, you know, not even half of the authors 
actually describe the results that way. They either ignored them or they called them neutral or mixed. Some even spun it as some sort of a negative. And so I think this is fairly clear evidence or at least very difficult to interpret in any way other than the fact that uh, we are quite hesitant to, for example, describe positive effects of habitat fragmentation when uh, we are supposed to be finding uh, negative effects according to the conventional wisdom. So I think this is fairly clear uh, case in which people's values have come into the way that they interpret their own science. So we don't want to necessarily get overly pessimistic. So maybe the, the, the biases are small and they're subtle and you know, science is, science is supposed to be self-correcting. So maybe we don't really have to worry about it. But one of the reasons I think uh, we might want to worry about it is because small biases can actually add up uh, to drastically changing what people consider conventional wisdom. So I want to use an analogy uh, from evolutionary biology. So uh, new mutations arise in populations. Uh, you know, so there's a very large population of, uh, of people in the photo uh, behind the text here. And if some mutation arises uh, that allows the people with that mutation to have, you know, a 5% increase in their survival. That doesn't sound like very much, but if there's a huge number of people uh, and we allow evolution to take place for a very long time, in fact, before you know it, every single person in the population is going to have uh, that mutation. So if we have a large population, weak selection favoring a certain uh, variant uh, over many generations, we have what we call fixation of the favored uh, variant. So Omicron, currently essentially displaced the Delta variant uh, of COVID. I wouldn't necessarily say that was weak selection, uh, but uh, you get my point. So I think in the context of, of science and biases, I think if most of the people in a discipline have a, have a weak tendency to, to only report or emphasize certain kinds of results, uh, and that happens among many people over a long time, you can actually end up with these, these components of what we call conventional wisdom that might in fact uh, deviate substantially from uh, the empirical facts. Uh, and so this uh, would be an example of what we might call cultural evolution of, uh, of, of scientific conventional wisdom. Okay, so uh, I can't actually see the top of my screen. One second. I don't remember what it says up there. Okay, so one situation in which um, almost everybody agrees that values can be problematic when doing science uh, is when we're talking about uh, companies that are trying to sell something. So if we think of pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, we might say they have values, you know, they, what they want to do is make a ton of money and they would really like to show that their drugs are safe because otherwise people aren't going to buy them. And then sometimes those same companies will do internal research asking questions like, will this drug help a lot of people and are the drugs safe? And I think most people see the situation and they say, well, I don't trust these people to do uh, you know, unbiased uh, science. And indeed there is very good evidence if you read books like this one, Merchants of Doubt, uh, indicating that in fact, um, you know, the scientists uh, involved in asking some of these questions uh, have biases that push them very far in certain directions. So I think most people would agree that there's a problem here. Now, what about when we talk about, uh, you know, conservation organizations, many of which do or interpret research themselves. And so these are ecological conservation organizations. And as I said, we bring to the table values such as diversity is good. Uh, and then we go about and we ask questions such as does biodiversity have instrumental value? Like, does it bring value to people? Um, so we're essentially asking the question that we've already decided uh, on an answer for. We have a pre preference for natural places, and then we ask questions about whether or not human disturbance causes biodiversity to decline. Uh, we have a preference for native over introduced species, uh, and then we ask whether or not introduced species have negative impacts. And you know, one of the main reasons we are we, we justify our own science uh, is that all of these things that we value are in serious trouble. And then we ask questions about whether or not things that we value uh, tend to be in trouble. And uh, I think, you know, I, I'm certainly not saying that, you know, all the science anybody does on these questions uh, can't be trusted, but that we certainly need to reflect on the degree to which our interpretation of the results, which can be highly variable from study to study and across different taxa and places, 
um, whether or not we should pay maybe closer attention to how our values are filtering uh, what it is that we say about those results. So on one hand, we might look at this contrast and say, well, we still have the you know, moral high ground because we're interested in protecting uh, nature, whereas these companies at the bottom are simply uh, greedy. Uh, but if we sort of just think more specifically about the question of whether or not science can be biased uh, by the values that we bring to the table, uh, you know, I'm not a sociologist, but I've, I've done a decent bit of reading and it sure seems like values and group belonging uh, can be a very strong motivator of people's reasoning uh, and just as strongly as uh, agreed. And so I think uh, there might be more similarities here than we like to think. And there might even be uh, overlap. So here's, uh, you know, an email uh, I got from the World Wildlife Fund because I've been donating uh, money to them to help protect uh, wildlife. And in that email, you know, it says, uh, you know, they use this uh, scientific result about, you know, different kinds of vertebrates, mammals, birds, amphibians, uh, for which they've calculated something called the Living Planet Index, uh, which is said to have declined by 68% in, you know, less than 50 years, uh, which is a catastrophe. And because that's true, I should click this button and donate, uh, which in fact I have done. Uh, but as a scientist, I actually, you know, have read the papers that sort of dig into the statistics like that and say, well, what do they actually mean? And so here's a study from uh, just a couple of years ago uh, in which, you know, the authors sort of tried to take apart where does this 68% decline statistic come from? And indeed, uh, they found that it's less than 3% of the populations that went into this database that are driving uh, that decline. If you get rid of those 3% uh, sort of extreme values, uh, and then you take all of the rest of the data, in fact, the trend switches to a positive trend instead of a negative one. So they found clusters of extreme decline, some clusters of extreme in in increase, and then across the middle, you know, almost 99% of populations, there was actually uh, no trend. And so here we have, you know, a convergence of science being used uh, for conservation purposes and to generate money for uh, conservation purposes. Okay, so in this last sort of little section of my talk, I want to just address how scientists can get involved in advocacy, because I've sort of been implying that it's a very uh, delicate balance when scientists want to also be advocates for certain kinds of uh, political outcomes. And the uh, framework that I want to present, which I think is quite useful, uh, is from this book by Roger Pilkey Jr. called The Honest Broker. Uh, and in collaboration with uh, Francoise Cardou, uh, an ongoing collaborator and recent uh, postdoc, we've been sort of trying to take this framework and ask, you know, specifically how can ecologists and conservation biologists make use of it? And so Francoise came up with a slightly modified version of the way they classify the different roles uh, that scientists can play when it comes to uh, their role in society. So the first question we can ask about somebody's science and trying to figure out what role it is they might play in society is whether or not there's some connection between the research they do and policy. And by policy, uh, Pilkey uses the term in an extremely broad sense, really any kind of action that people take out in the world, you know, that, that might be influenced by, by the science, not just the sort of laws of the land, if you will. And if there really is no connection to policy, uh, uh, then, you know, we, we can say that a scientist is, is just a pure scientist. They're doing, they can do science without any uh, thought at all as to whether or not uh, there will be any application uh, whatsoever. So at the bottom here, we're going to have some different roles that scientists can play. And this, this first one is not, you know, of particular interest given the, the present uh, discussion we're having. So for the next question that uh, uh, we can ask, is whether or not on the topic at hand, there's values consensus. So do people agree, you know, on the political issues involved uh, in terms of their values uh, and whether or not there's low uncertainty in the science, but really uh, in this framework, it's, it's the values uh, that is the key. So if everybody agrees on the values, then uh, we can do what's called, you know, science arbitration. You can be a science arbiter. And just to illustrate what I mean, uh, what Pilkey uses to describe this is, is a sort of hypothetical situation that he calls tornado politics. So you imagine a group of people having a meeting in a building and the meteorologists call to tell them that there's a tornado coming straight towards the building. There's values consensus in the sense that everybody uh, 
nobody wants to die. Everybody agrees they would like to survive this tornado. The meteorologists see the tornado going towards the building. If they get out of it or into the basement, they're gonna survive. And so there's a direct line from the science to people's actions. Uh, and so if, if everybody's in agreement about what they would like to achieve, uh, then a scientist can be a simple arbiter. However, if there is no values consensus, uh, we're in a situation that Pilkey you know, uses an extreme example to call abortion politics. So when people uh, politically debate uh, abortion, it is almost entirely based on values. You can throw science at it that has to do with you know, the status of a fetus at a different age, but the, the, the argument that is taking place has to do almost entirely with uh, values. And so if there's no values consensus, uh, the last question uh, that Pilkey asks is whether or not the scientist is going to aim to reduce the scope of choice in terms of policy. Uh, that is, are they going to try to promote a, a very particular uh, outcome or, or, or policy, or are they going to serve to uh, broaden um, the possible policy options that might help deal with the various trade-offs involved in a given issue? And so if in fact, somebody is attempting to reduce the scope of choice in policy. Uh, this is what Pilkey would call an issue advocate. So they're advocating for some very specific uh, policy. And if they're going to broaden that, they're what he calls uh, the honest broker. So they're going to present what we know scientifically about the feasibility of various solutions uh, to these difficult problems where values are not uh, completely aligned. And I think this can be pretty uh, useful for uh, well, science in general, but certainly for uh, ecology. So the issue, or one of the key issues that uh, he identifies is that in terms of issue adv advocacy, what is often actually happening is what he calls stealth issue advocacy. So scientists act as if science can settle a values dispute. So people are having a dispute that is really based about values, but then we have these intense arguments about whether or not the science is certain on, on particular uh, uh, points. And so here he says that the, the typical strategy of the stealth issue, issue advocate is to seek to reframe as tornado politics an issue that is more accurately characterized as abortion politics. So there might be very st strong differences in values at play, uh, but we present the science as if uh, it only could possibly point in one direction. Or, or as in, in, terms of, in terms of policy, as if it can resolve a values dispute. Whoops. Uh, and in these cases, you know, he'll say that the debate of certainty and uncertainty is largely disconnected from the real reasons for uh, political debate. Here, he specifically talks about climate change, which comes up repeatedly in discussions of this nature. So just to give you an example uh, of, of what I think would sort of fall into this category, we very often hear the expression, uh, listen to science when it comes to uh, promoting certain uh, kinds of policies. So Johan Rockström is, uh, uh, one of the originators of what's called the planetary boundaries concept, uh, defining you know, limits of things like nutrient input or climate or biodiversity loss beyond which uh, you know, uh, humanity has not experienced during the last 10,000 uh, years or so, for example. And so here, you know, he says something that you hear very frequently that we need decision makers to listen to science. Uh, you can go to the Audubon website, uh, and here, here we're told that actually it's birds that are telling us to take action on climate. And you can, you can sign the pledge asking elected, elected officials to listen to science. And uh, when people say that, uh, mostly what they mean, and I'm quoting somebody else here, I can't remember who it is. What they're saying is listen to the scientists who are also bringing their values to, table, to the table. The science can tell you about the consequences of things, but it shouldn't tell you about which, it can't tell you which outcome you should prefer. And then you get them parroted back by the politicians. So when the, as soon as the politicians start uh, uh, repeating, listen to science, we've come full circle. The science has been entirely politicized at this point, uh, whereby uh, advocates for different positions can almost always find certain bits of science that support their point of view. Uh, and we are in a serious conundrum as, as scientists as to what role we can actually play. Uh, and so, you know, according to Pilkey, stealth issue advocacy poses a, a real threat to the scientific enterprise. The next quote is fairly long. I just couldn't figure out how to uh, make it much shorter. So we'll just read it because uh, I think it, you know, captures one of the key issues here. So if the public or policymakers 
begin to believe that scientific findings are simply an extension of a scientist's political beliefs, two things will happen. The scientific information will play an increasingly diminishing role in policymaking, and it's gonna play a correspondingly larger role in the marketing of particular uh, political agendas. And this is, as a scientist, what I, what I, what I fear uh, might, might happen or might be happening. So what do ecologists and conservation biologists actually do? So people uh, legitimately play all of these roles. Uh, so uh, the pure scientist role, I would say, is fairly rare if we think of policy in the very uh, sort of broad sense of doing uh, of, of, of any kind of human action uh, out in the world, or at least it's not terribly applicable to our current discussion. Uh, I think there are many situations in being a science arbiter is entirely possible, especially when, when we're talking about uh, management, which we might think of as a very specific kind of policy. So inside a national park where they have specific predefined goals uh, uh, about what they are trying to achieve with management, science can be arbiters in determining what kinds of techniques might be used uh, to achieve those goals. If a particular policy um, uh, you know, has, has predefined goals and the question is how to achieve it, uh, then I think uh, we can most definitely be uh, science arbiters. Issue advocates uh, are very frequently found in political debates, but what worries me is that it's it's very often in the stealth mode. Uh, so we, we will sort of act as if we're being arbiters where, where you know, everybody must have the same values, but in fact, uh, our own values are playing a major role in what kinds of policies it is that we're actually uh, uh, supporting. And then this honest broker role uh, is something that uh, one most definitely sees, but I think that we could strive perhaps to do it more frequently. So uh, I have a good colleague, Elena Bennett at uh, McGill University, who works within communities and at certain communities in southern Quebec, and, and they'll essentially uh, paint pictures of possible future ways that a municipality might look uh, given competing ecosystem services that they might like to uh, promote. So maybe they want more recreation, maybe they want more agricultural production, maybe they want, uh, you know, more water filtration going into the rivers. And there's definite trade-offs among these things. And they present different scenarios that link potential policies to potential outcomes. So instead of pushing, you know, people to do a particular thing, they can uh, lay out the consequences of what might happen if they make uh, certain policy decisions. So just a few final thoughts uh, to cap things off. Uh, so sometimes one hears that we can just sort of wave a magic wand and sort of, I can just turn off my values for the moment and then go do my science. And I think uh, that's, a, that's a lot to, 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 to hope for. I'm not sure uh, that's so easily uh, done. And I think we can only gain by paying more attention to whether and how our values, whether and how our values are inserting, inserting what might be subtle, but ultimately consequential biases uh, into our science. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the major uh, things we're doing in science at the moment is promoting uh, diversity along many axes. I think this is a wonderful uh, development. And one of the axes that we haven't actually thought about very much is, uh, you know, the sort of values that people bring to the table that are relevant to some of the major uh, policy challenges that ecology actually uh, relates to. And that's something that we could think about as well. With that, I. Thank you very much.